Uh, emotional resilience is essentially a mindset. It's a state of mind and a state of feeling. Uh, it's very ephemeral and it has a particular nature. And as a result of its nature, its, uh, its job is to allow people to effectively adjust to the circumstances they face, especially if those circumstances are painful or but even better, overcome the circumstances that they face, especially if those circumstances are difficult. So we call this emotional resilience, and it's a giant concept. Now what I'd like to do now is jump to my description of the concept in a single jump, and then we'll break it into its subset parts and talk about it one piece at a time. We've got lots of people joining, this is lovely. Um, can I ask you please to refer to that diagram there? This is uh, the whole thing. So I'm starting at the end. That's the whole thing. Uh, and I'd like to take this um, step by step. But that's the end and the beginning of this course. We'll start here and we'll finish here. That's the, that's the visualization. Now, uh, center your eyes onto that word feeling. Emotional resilience really is an emotion and an emotion is a feeling. So our key concept on that diagram for our starting point will be the word feeling. And that feeling can only come when it is surrounded by the things that surround it. In other words, everything has a cause. In fact, everything has multiple causes. And the feeling of emotional resilience is caused and sustained by the things that surround it, i.e. a rational and knowledgeable action, a strong physiology and a strong psychology. So even though the diagram looks complicated, it can be reduced to three major sets. Uh, it can be the intellect, i.e. the rational and the, and the knowledgeable part of the human mind. It can be the physiology, which is uh, the top part of the diagram, the physical body. You heard of the phrase healthy mind, healthy body, healthy body, and then healthy mind, which is the psychology. So our diagram really, although it's big, it reduces down to three subsets. There are three emotional causes, correction, there are three causes for emotional resilience. They are intellectual, psychological and physiological. And what I'd like to do, if I may, oh, but if you're taking notes, that's the first note to write down. <laughs> if there are three, if you are taking handwritten notes, jot those down. They are the three major categories of causes, intellectual, psychological, physiological. Now, there is a fourth, which is environmental. The only problem with environmental is you can't control the environment. You might have noticed that, by the way. You can't control other people and you can't control the environment. So I've left it off our list of discussion because there's no point talking about things we can't control. But theoretically, you can control your mind, in theory at least. Everyone's got their, their own mind and they can take some certain amount of control. And that is the intellectual and the psychological portion of that, that not model. And everybody can uh, affect their own body by various means. So we have control over our mind, we have, we have the limited correction, we have the opportunity to control our mind and we have the opportunity to control our physiology. Physio physiology. So that's where we're going, we're going for the things we can do. Now let's take, our, um, let's take them step at a time. Let's take uh, intellectual. So um, what's the best way of doing this? Probably this. I'm zooming in on my diagram now to the intellectual portion of our model. And that's got two subsets, uh, factual knowledge factual knowledge, and uh, rational and uh, irrational evalu evaluations. Okay, so number one, the first thing to say about emotional, uh, emotional stability, emotional resilience, it is dependent upon certain conditions and those are, you know what's going on around you. You have a fairly good idea of what's going on around you. You have access to factual knowledge. That's the first precondition. Now, uh, what happens if you don't? Or what happens if you don't, uh, or what happens if you uh, assume things which would be factual and they're not facts, they're effectively uh, lies, if you will. They're not true. So factual knowledge is the first thing that we have to have. Now I'm making reference to the book. I'm on page uh, four in the book. 
And what happens if you get hold of wrong knowledge? What would be the consequences to the emotions if you're in the habit of getting hold of wrong knowledge? Now, let's just answer question uh, one on page four. Question, what are the negative consequences associated to guessing or listening to unreliable sources of information? So if the person is negligent in the sense that they just pick up any old idea, any bit of gossip and treat that as knowledge, what would happen to their emotional stability? Would you please jot down an answer and maybe somebody would tell us? What happens to the person's emotional stability if they're in the habit of accepting anything as true? Would anybody jot down uh, the night? So would anybody give us a verbal answer to that? Does anybody want to speak? If you don't speak, I will. <laughs> oh, we've got uh, Maggie. Yeah, Maggie, please. Yeah. Um, they have become very unstable because they're relying on unreliable yeah. sources, really. So. Right. I don't think they'd be a very stable person, but body and mind because of that. Exactly right. And that's their reactions will actually be quite unrational either as well. Perfect. So it's as good, yeah, I mean, it's garbage in, garbage out. You've heard that phrase from computing, garbage in, garbage out. Well, if we say our mind is like a supercomputer, garbage in, garbage out, and that affects the emotions, you see, because the, uh, the knowledge affects what we think we know affects our feelings. So I'm going to leave the second question for your own uh, perusal. The pet question on page four, we won't discuss today because it's too big. But if you could answer that question, it's going to take about half an hour. Question, how are you going to distinguish a fact from an opinion? Let's assume that there are, a fa uh, there are big distinctions to be made between the word opinion and the word fact. But the question is, how many, um, how do you make that distinction? Okay, so that's the first point I want to say about factual knowledge. It is, is a precondition for emotional stability. The next one is rationality. Rationality. Now, rationality is mankind's means of survival. We are the only animal on the planet that uses its rational faculty to survive with. So it's our rational faculty that makes us more than a chimpanzee. The rule is we must treat all people and all problems according to the principles of reason. Now, if we're not acting rationally, we're acting irrationally. I'll say that again. If we're not acting rationally, we're acting irrationally. So rationality is a precondition of emotional stability, because otherwise you're irrational. We have a question. Question, please. Um, are there any facts? Are, are there any facts or are they all just someone's opinion? Good question. That's a really good question. Are there any facts? According to our theory, absolutely there are facts and there are opinions. And it's absolutely vital that you have a method of distinguishing facts from opinion. OK, and that method is reason and the method of reason is logic. So now I'm introducing the next concept. Could you tie the word reason and logic together? Meaning, if you want to be rational, you're going to have to know something about logic because logic is the means of determining effectively a valid argument from an invalid one. And a valid argument from an invalid one. Rationality and logic are two concepts which are stuck together. The purpose of logic is to make your reasoning coherent. Coherent reasoning, which means it's self-consistent, non-contradictory. It might contradict other people's opinions, but it doesn't contradict itself. In other words, the person is of clear mind. I'll say that again. They are self within their own mind, they are self-consistent. That's the rational, logical mind. What happens to the person who's not logical, not irrational, irrational, illogical? They are inconsistent in their mind. They contradict themselves every moment. In the morning, they say one thing. In the afternoon, they do the opposite. Do you know people who do that? They say one thing, but do the opposite. And they're inconsistent in their speech and their actions. So rationality and, lo and logic really implies a single word, which is coherence or self-consistency. Self-consistency would give you the feeling of stability. You might be wrong, by the way, which is why you have to make sure that your logic is attached to the facts, because you can be floating off in, into dreamland, still logical within your own terms, but not connected to the facts. So we've got three words now tied together. Facts, uh, reason and logic. All of these are good. If you've got the facts, if you're evaluating them rationally and logically, then that would have a positive effect 
on the emotions because you would feel a sense of certainty. Now, what would happen if you were, we've got the facts, but you're evaluating the facts illogically. That's the problem, evaluating the facts illogically. So can you look at question five? Qu no, qu correction, could you look at page five? The phrase is a rational evaluation of all the available evidence. What does that mean to you? What does it mean to say, in order to achieve uh, stability intellectually and emotionally, you need to uh, master the art of evaluating the facts rationally? You need to make a rational evaluation of the available evidence. Can you just jot down what does that mean to you? What does, if I say make a rational evaluation of all the available evidence, what first thoughts come to mind? Could you jot them down? It's a big yeah. ask. Yeah, logic. In a single word, logic. Yeah. Logic behind your opinion. Yes, you need a logic behind your opinion. You need to be able to present a coherent argument, not only to other people, but to yourself. What happens if you can't present to yourself, in your own mind, a reason why? Yeah. You know? Connection between evidence. This is excellent. Connection between evidence peer related resources reflect and question and then reevaluate and evaluate logically now uh, let's just uh, look at the other side what would be the example of an irrational evaluation there are many would you agree that many people out there are acting irrationally <laughs> now what does it mean to say irrationally let me give you three number one wishful thinking they believe it because it would be nice if it was true or they believe it because they feel like believing it. My mum's one of these. She believes it if she likes it. That's it. I asked her, why do you buy those products, mum? They don't work. She says, well, they, they do work because it would be nice if they did. So she has a lot of faith in these alternative remedies, which I don't have much faith in. And she buys, she buys thousands of pounds worth of kit, which I think are completely a scam. But she likes the idea, so she buys it. Yeah mind over matter, unconscious bias. Unconscious bias, yeah, they call that selective perception, where you only accept in information which corresponds to your original belief, and you blank out anything which does not correspond to your original belief. That's called uh, selective perception, and it makes you unbalanced because you are no longer open to new information. Now, that is a great way to mess you up, you see, because you, in a way you become too certain, too dogmatic, unable to change. So rationality is our next concept. We've got factual knowledge and rationality and we've thrown in the word logic. So that's the end of my short presentation on the intellectual per component of uh, emotional stability. Now let's go to the psychological component. Um, Here's a punchline. If you want to take a punchline down, one of it is this. You feel whatever you think about. You feel whatever you think about. I'll say that again, it's a punchline. You feel whatever you think about. You don't feel what actually is, you feel what you think is. And you don't feel what actually is, you feel what you believe to be. See. So now, so for, for example, if you think they're lying, you'll feel annoyed. If you think you can't win, you'll, you won't feel any confidence. If you think you're bound to lose, you won't feel any confidence. If you think you're going to win, you'll feel confident. It's not what actually is, it's what you think is that makes a big difference to how you feel. Reality itself does not make emotions for you. Your thoughts about reality make the emotions. So if you think Boris Johnson is great, that will make you feel like voting for him. If you think he's rubbish, it will make you feel like not voting for him. It's what you think determines your feelings, not the facts of reality. I'll say that again. The facts of reality do not determine how a person feels. It's the thinking that determines how the person feels. Now, the next question is, who determines what you think about? And the answer is, you do. So it said... And you look and find more evidence to back up what? Yes, that's yes. the about our logic. Yes, you're always looking for more evidence. Okay, continuing on. 
It's not reality that determines how you feel. It's what you think about reality and what you think about yourself and what you believe to be true. So people's belief systems and their thought patterns, their habitual thought patterns make a big difference to their, well, it is the difference essentially. This is the thing. It's what you think about. Then the next question is who determines what you think about? And the only person who determines what you think about is you, if you claim it, because it's possible to be passive. It is possible to take your hands off the steering wheel of your mind and allow your mind to be affected by outside circumstances, by what you see in the newspapers, by what you hear people say, by what the politicians say and the media say. And what happens is if you take your mind into, if you don't take control of your mind, your mind is taken control of by other people. Because there's plenty of people out there who are paid a lot of money to influence your mind. And the biggest influence on your mind should be you. So we, we talk about self-determination here. This is self-determination as opposed to determination. We believe in self-determination, not determined from outside forces. What happens if you believed your, what happens if you believe that you were the, the product of outside forces? You have nothing to do with you, effectively. You're like a leaf in the wind being blown by circumstances. But if that's what you think, how will you feel? If you think that there's nothing you can do, you're a leaf in the wind being blown by outside circumstances, what's that going to do to your emotional resilience? Well, that single thought will destroy it. So what I'd like to uh, suggest is, is that the way that you feel on any given moment is determined by the colour of your dominant thoughts and beliefs. So now I'm going to pick up on this word of thoughts and I'd like to make a couple of distinctions about the psychologies that tend to have a positive effect and psychologies which tend to have a negative effect. The first uh, distinction I'd like to draw to your attention is what I call the locus of control or more colloquially every job or every situation can be split into two parts. The part that we can affect and the part we can't. So any situation is split into two sets in here. Any situation I walk into, I ask myself, what can I affect and what can't I affect? Because I have to know. Because the person who has the most emotional stability focuses on the thing they can do something about. And the people with the least emotional stability focus on the things they can't do anything about. That's their biggest Achilles heel, psychologically speaking. Now I'm on page... Uh, six. Question. What are the painful consequences that must be paid to those people who focus all of their attention onto the things that they cannot change? Can you just think about that? Jot down an answer. Page six. Okay, do you know anyone who does this? They focus on the things they can't do anything about. It leads to procrastination, yeah. Because effectively they give up. They say, well, the, the, you, can't, you can't fight it. Yeah. They need to focus on the... They need to focus on the circle of influence, not the circle of concern. Thank you, that's another model that you might know. I think that's Stephen Covey, isn't it? Think circle of influence, think circle of concern. Yeah, yeah, Stephen Covey, right? if you know the book Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Dr. Stephen Covey, he talks a lot about this. And it's a major distinction. I'm using the words taken from another guy you might know, if you're a reader, you probably know Napoleon Hill. Napoleon Hill, who wrote Phone Think and Grow Rich, he talks about the same concept, but he says the can-do portion of the job and the no-can-do portion of the job. Uh, somebody says resilience, focusing on the things you cannot change, can lead to feeling something <laughs> feeling down uh, disabled at the butt end of, of, of circumstances so you see so that's the thing uh, to make take this distinction seriously have in your mind two sets at all points and effectively put 99 percent of your effort onto the can do was jim uh, napoleon hill says get your efforts onto the can do portion of the job he's got this southern accent the can-do portion of the job. 
Focus your mind there. Keep your mind off the no can do portion. <laughs> uh, let me draw your attention to the next question on question six. If we agree that the can do portion of the job is where we should put the lion's share of our mental energy, uh, we have to get this into a set of habits. And not only habits for ourselves, but for our colleagues and for our family members. We have to guide them. So my question is this, what mechanism could you adopt which would encourage you and your colleagues and family uh, to focus solely onto the can-do portion of the job? We're looking for methodology. Would anybody like to give us some methodology that would allow us to influence others onto the can-do portion of the job and away from the no-can-do portion of the job? Would anybody give us a one-liner? Okay, well, my answer is simply to ask the question. I just asked the question. So, okay, I know there's a million things we can't do, but what can we do? Being proactive rather than reactive. Yes, to be proactive rather than reactive. So we are always actors. Uh, we are always doing something. Somebody says, oh, well, I wonder what will become of me. You know, that's a terrible phrase. I wonder what will become of us. As if we are just pa passive actors in someone else's play. And whatever they say, whoever they are, is what was going to happen to me. So you're anxiously looking at the television to see what decisions are going to be made about your future without you even having a say, that type of thing. So what we do is we make sure that we are active agents in our own lifestyles. I heard Tony Robbins say, if, uh, if, if you don't control your future, somebody else will. Uh, so that's, we, we, we pick up the can-do portion, portion of the job. Okay, that's that distinction. Moving on to the next distinction. Review options for success. Yes, review your options. There's a, there's a, <laughs> I'm picking from everybody. I'm picking from Captain Kirk now. He says, I don't believe in a no-win scenario. Have you ever heard of that from Captain Kirk? He says, I've never believed in a no-win scenario. So now, so now I'm going to move into the next distinction. The distinction of optimism versus pessimism. Now, when you look into the future, could you divide the future into two parts? The future could either be better than the present or worse than the present. That's the only two options. I mean, theoretically, you could say it's the same, but it won't be the same because we know that everything changes. Right. So everything changes. We know that the future will not be exactly the same as today, but it will either be broadly better for you or worse for you. Now, the point about mental stability is you have to give yourself reasons to go back to that word reason. You have to come up with reasons to believe that the future, at least for you and your family, will be better than the present. It might not be as good as it used to be, but it's going to be damn sight better than it is now. Now, that's the basic premise of the person with mental stability. The person with mental instability is the person who accepts the opposite premise that the future is, and I heard this on the newspaper the other day, it's bad and it's going to get worse. It's bad and it's going to get worse. That was on the, on the Guardian newspaper front page. It's bad and it's going to get worse. Now, what happens if that person reads that, accepts that into the subconscious mind and walks, walks around acting on that premise? If they believe, correction, if they believe and if they think that it's bad and it's going to get worse, what will that do to their feelings on a consistent basis? Well, it's obvious. It's going, to, it's going to destroy their feelings of emotional resilience. If they believe it's bad, then it's going to get worse. So let's have a look at the questions. What questions have we got on that? Can I ask you to look at page seven? What effect does persistent pessimism have on the emotional states and the productivity of the team? So now we're taking the word feeling and pushing it over to the word actions. If we say that the actions are related to the productivity, see, everything connects to everything else. So if the person thinks consistently that the future will be bad, they feel pessimistic, what would that do to their actions and therefore their productivity in terms of their results? Can you jot down the answer to that on page seven? They would lose their motivation, correct. And if they lost their motivation, they're going to stop acting. And if they stop acting, their results get worse. Why? Because if you do nothing, it always gets worse. 
It's called the law of entropy in physics. If you have to keep something the same, you have to pour energy into it. So, for example, if you've got a cup of coffee, it gets cold unless you pour energy in. If you leave your garden, it gets worse. If you leave your car, it gets worse. You can't leave it alone and expect it to stay the same. It won't. If you leave it alone, it will get worse. If you ignore something, it gets worse. So you have to pour energy in. There's that word energy there. You have to pour energy into the system the whole time, even to keep it as it is. And if you want to make advancements, you have to pour a lot more energy in. Okay, you've got the negativity spreads across the team and then ripples outwards. Absolutely. Paralyzed teams. Ooh, paralyzed team from pessimism and negative thinking based upon the belief that the, it's bad and it's going to get worse. Now, you have to fight like fury against that because I would suggest to you that the culture that we live in is generating thoughts that the, it's bad and it's going to get worse. Even though they say build back better and all the rest of it, when you look at the tone of the media, it's mostly negative. And, oh, and by the way, that's not new. <laughs> The tone of the media being negative is not a new phenomenon. As far as I can tell, it's always been negative. It's always said it's bad and it's going to get worse. Uh, so that has a negative effect on the cultural psychology and the individual psychologies. Now, can you look at the question at uh, point se uh, question seven bottom? What can you do? What can we do to transform the negative conversations into something more productive? We've got to change the way people think. We've got to give them reasons to believe that the future will be better than the present. Note the word reason. We've got to give them reasons to believe that the future, and this is not just, oh, don't worry, think positive. It's got to be a lot more than that because think positive doesn't work very well on its own. You have to give them clear, specific, logical reasons to accept the premise that the future will be better than today. You can't just magic this out of nowhere. That belief doesn't come from nowhere. That belief has to have reasons. Without reasons, they won't believe it, you see. And you have to trust the other person's intelligent enough not to accept anything without any reasons or any logic. So you must provide that logic. And that's not difficult to do. There's plenty of reasons. I'm pretty good at that, by the way, finding reasons to believe that I'm going to be fine. <laughs> and that's the basis of optimism. Now, the next one is even more profound. One of the beliefs that really determine, and this is really the bottom line, this is the bottom line here. The bottom line of emotional resilience is your self-concept. Or the bottom line of a person's resilience is their self-concept or their self-image. Now let me give you a definition of the, the term self-concept and self-image. Those two are, the, are synonymous. They mean the same thing. It's just different words expressing the same concept. The self-image is the idea that the person has in their own mind which tells them who and what they are. It tells, in other words, when you're born, you don't know much. You don't very little. You know to be afraid of loud noises and to be afraid of, of being dropped and to know, you know how to suckle, and that's it. Everything else you have to learn. And what happens is we get into um, habits of thought, just like every other habit, we get into habits of thought. And one of the most important decisions that a child has to make is, who am I? When I look in the mirror, who is that person? What, does that, what is that person's capabilities? What is that person's limitations? What is that person's uh, controlled by, if, it, if this person is controlled? And also, uh, what can I do? What can't I do? Uh, and when you develop your self-image over a period of a decade or two, let's say by the time you get to 22, certainly by the time you get to 25, your self-image is a very stable entity. And then it affects every single thing that you do, say and feel. If your self-image is uh, down, you've, got, you've heard that phrase, people with low levels of self-esteem. Self-esteem is the same thing. Okay, self-image, self-concept, self-esteem. They're all derivat derivatives of each other. If you've got a person with low self-esteem, that has a knock-on effect to practically every single thing about them. Because the self-esteem, self-image, affects how they feel. It affects their physical body, their heart rate in certain situations. It affects what they do. And it affects their results. 
This really is the bedrock of personality, the self-image. It's a, it's a subset of the word belief. It is the belief about who you think you really are or how the person thinks they really are. Now, um, it's very important to take the self-image as a thing to be worked on, not just take it as a given. You know, this is a malleable thing, although it's quite, uh, by the time you get to our age, it's difficult to change your self-image, but it's possible. Uh, the way you dress, the way you speak, what you will say, and even if you will say anything at all, is governed by your self-image. If you just take that as a given and never challenge it and question it, where the hell did that come from anyway? That came from your parents, that came from your siblings, that came from your upbringing, the magazines you've read and the films you've seen and the decisions you've made about yourself determines who you are. Now, I've got a great phrase which I took from a guy called Brian Tracy. Do you know Brian Tracy, anyone? Probably do. Uh, top of page nine. I got this from Brian Tracy. I thought this was quite sweet. Uh, you're not what you think you are, but what you think you are. <laughs> I thought that was so cool. You're not what you think you are, but what you think you are or you become. Uh, whatever you think you are is what you become. So if you're, think you're, if you're thinking about robbing a bank, you're a bank robber, even before you've robbed the bank. Right? <laughs> if you think you're going to, if you think like a criminal, you're actually a criminal. All that's happening, all that's going to have to happen now is circumstances will have to arrange themselves. You'll see your wallet, you'll pick it up because you've already got the mindset of a criminal. You see, and the mindset is uh, maybe determined from outside sources, but the other person has to agree. You see. You have to agree to what you are. And then if you don't agree with that, you can make changes. Now, I know that's possible because I did it to myself. I changed myself over a period of decades. I am radically different from every other member of my family because I trained myself to be, because there were certain elements that I was brought up with, which I didn't really like. And I thought, I'm going to rebrand myself. I'm going to evolve into something different. So when I go to my family parties, I'm quite quiet now because I don't speak the way I used to, because I changed. Can I ask you to look at page nine? To what degree do you, th oh, no, the, the, let me just give you a particular distinction. I've got lots of distinctions here, uh, all under the general heading of uh, self-image. Are you, do you believe yourself to be goal focused or not? Do you believe yourself to be intelligent or not? Do you believe yourself to be hard working or not? You know, so these are major questions. So I heard somebody say, I'm not very clever. Okay, they said to me, I'm not very clever. Now, what does that do to their self-image when they tell me that they are not clever? I said, will you stop saying that to me? Because I've only just met you. <laughs> and I don't want you to take, I've got quite a high opinion of people when I meet them and it stays high unless they give me evidence to suggest it isn't. But when the person walks in and says, I'm not very clever, immediately I drop my expectation of that person and I think what they're doing is they're doing it in order to they say to themselves in a minute he's going to feel he's going to discover that I'm not very clever so in order to save my embarrassment and save everybody time I'm just going to tell him I think that's what happens you see they, they've got such a low self-esteem they blurt it out before they get through the door um, so you've got to be very careful about what you say about yourself to yourself and you have to be very selective because whatever you say will come true. Whatever you say, you are sustaining in your soul and that becomes true for you, you see. You can change that simply by changing what you ac accept as words in here. And especially don't de de denigrate yourself to other people unless they are in a position to help you. If you want to denigrate yourself to your counsellor or to your wife or husband, somebody you can actually help, then denigrate yourself, but don't denigrate yourself in general public. Don't say you're not very good at reading maps or you're no good at math or you've got a very bad memory because every time you print that out into other people's minds, you're reconfirming your bad memory skills in your own mind and you become a self-fulfilling prophecy. So this is extremely important for most people because they don't give it any thought. If you want a book on it, or say it to your colleagues or children. Oh, children are, are very susceptible to suggestion from their parents. 
Never tell your kid they're a naughty boy. Never tell them they're clumsy. Never tell them that they are bad. Because whatever an adult tells the child who is under five or seven years of age is the person they will become. Self-love is important. That's exactly correct. I'm just going to really bang on about if you're a parent, this is absolutely crucial that you tell your kid what you want the kid to be rather than what he is right now or she is right now. If the person spills a drink and you say you clumsy, you see you printed mummy called me clumsy, I'm clumsy. Now if she thinks she's clumsy, she acts clumsy. So what you say is, that was clumsy, could you be careful? You're careful, I know you're a very careful person normally. So would you please be careful and pump in the good? Uh, when I, when I was, uh, had my little kids, they were tiny, tiny, tiny ones. And every night when they went to bed, I used to say to them as a mantra, you're good, you're clever and you're nice. You're good, you're clever and you're nice. And I just used to pump it into them all day long. And even when I thought they were asleep, I'd walk up and whisper into their ear, you're good, you're clever and you're nice. And I did that as a matter of principle. I got that from Brian Tracy, by the way. And um, years later, when I was talking to my daughter, Samantha, I was telling, because she's got kids now, and I was telling her about affirmations for kids. And uh, I said to her, I, I had this affirmation, Sam, that I told you all the time when you were just a little kid. And, and then she said, yeah, good, clever and nice. And I said, oh, you remember it? Do you remember me doing that? She said, no. <laughs> she said, no, I don't remember you doing it, but I know what it is. <laughs> right? So that just blew my mind. It was in all the way at the back. It was still there. And when I said, do you ever remember me saying that to you? She said, no, I don't remember. Because I was five or four or three or two, you see but it's still there. And Sammy is good, clever and nice. So is Becky. She's good, clever and nice. And that is, I don't think that's by chance. I think that's by cause and effect. But the one I like to draw your attention to is self-determined. And I've drawn your attention to that a couple of times already today. You have a choice to make. Are you determined by forces beyond your control, brackets, other people? Or are you determined by your own mind? Who's in charge of the way you feel? Because to tell you the person who's in charge of the way I feel, which is me, I am, I, determine, I am the final arbiter on how I feel. I'm very difficult to get, you can't wind me up and get me angry because I've learned how to deal with it. And I, you can't scare me either because I've learned how to deal with it. And I've learned how to deal with it by recognizing the fact that no one controls my mind but me. That's what I say to myself, and I take that statement seriously. And when somebody, when somebody says, how does that make you feel? That doesn't compute to me. I say, it doesn't make me feel anything. I haven't decided yet how it's going to make me feel. I'll think about it. I'll give you my answer tomorrow. But I am not instantaneously reacting emotionally to outside circumstances, because I think it through before I decide my emotional reaction. Now, some of people might call that cold and robotic. I call it emotional intelligence. You've heard that phrase before, emotional intelligence. Now, emotional intelligence is taking the intellect and applying it to the emotions. And you do that by taking that point seriously, that we are all the, eight, are the final arbiter on what we think about. And we have to take that point as a serious point. Um, have a look at question nine. No, <laughs> have a look at the second question on page nine. How could we maximize other people's perception of their own personal power? Because a lot of people feel disempowered. There's a lot of people out there feel completely disempowered. And I feel like I'm not, I got two things. I feel sorry for them because I wish I, I'm glad I don't live like that. And secondly, I want to help them because I don't think people should walk around feeling completely disempowered. And what I want to be able to help them by the gift of the gap. Uh, what would you put here? How could you maximise the perception of their own personal power? Give them positive feedback. Thank you. There's a nice phrase in one of the books I've read called catch them doing it right. Rather than, going back to kids, rather than catch them doing it wrong all the time. Don't do that. Stop that. Don't do that. Catch them doing it right. You say, that's fantastic drawing. Could you draw me another one? Just the same. You're a brilliant drawer. You're very musical. You've got a terrific memory. You know, you just keep telling them that they are, the, especially for kids, you keep, t not what they are, but what you want them to be, you see. 
Now, you, you can say, is this dishonest? No, it's emotional intelligence. You're programming that person's mind to the good. As a, because the vast majority of influences out there are to the no good. We want to be an influence to the good. Okay, I've got one more final set. Everything I've done up till now has been the mind. The mind meaning the rational mind, the knowledgeable mind. The mind meaning the psychological thoughts, the can-do portion of the job, the beliefs that we're, the future will be better than the past. And correction, the future will be better than the present. And the biggie, the self-image. That's the bottom line. You see, self-image is the bottom line. But I'm just going to return back to a phrase I used earlier. Healthy mind, healthy body. You've heard of that, haven't you? It comes from ancient Greece, Hipparchus and all these other people. Healthy mind, healthy body. Let's zoom in on this. See, here's another thing. When people... I'll say this, first of all. Would you agree that optimism takes more energy than pessimism? Joy is more energetic than depression. If you see somebody is depressed, they aren't usually doing very much. They're lying down in bed with a pillow over their head. It's shallow breathing. They don't have much physical energy. So there's a, there's a cyclic relationship between emotions and feelings. Depression takes the energy out of you and losing energy makes you depressed. They're, they're, they're relational, you see. There's a feedback going on between the two. Now, we're now taking our, our mind to the word physical body. I take my physical body extremely seriously because I act as if my life depends on it, <laughs> because it does. Now, the key word here is energy. Energy. The world stuff is energy. You've heard E equals MC squared. The whole universe is made out of uh, energy, time, uh, matter and space. So there's only a couple of things in the universe and energy is one of them. Energy is the most important thing for us because everything we do requires energy. Question, what is the scientific definition of the term energy out of the physics books? Do anybody remember this from their physics classes? The definition of the word energy, if you're taking notes, it's this. Energy is defined as the capacity to do work. The capacity to do work. That's straight out of a physics book. Now, work in physics has a particular meaning, but that's not a bad definition for everyday speech. The capacity to get up and go to work requires energy. Now, the point I'd like to suggest here is energy, as you know, energy cannot be created or destroyed. It has to be generated from existing circumstances. You can't make energy. You have to generate energy. And the generation of energy is uh, created by metabolism. It comes from the inside. Uh, you eat food, it goes inside, and then your body metabolizes it, you see. Now, the point I'd like to make is when f people feel down in the dumps, they don't feel very good emotionally. What they do is they get into the habit of changing their physical body by means which I would consider to be wrong. They are me many people, when they don't feel good about themselves or circumstances, the first thing they turn to is alcohol. They try to drink their way out of trouble. And they, so I say, why are you drinking so much? He said, it's a way of dealing with stress. I think, uh -uh, it isn't a way of dealing with stress. It's a way of killing yourself and making your situation a lot worse over time. So you can't drink your way out of trouble. The next one is people turn to food as a comfort. Have you heard people use the phrase comfort eater? I'm a comfort eater. And they're using food effectively as the substitute for a friend or, the sub, or just comfort, you know, because it's self-inherently stimulating to eat chocolate. <laughs> so, but the problem is, it creates its own problems. And people turn to drugs. Now, drugs splits into two types, illegal and legal. Uh, but I'm just going to put that as a single category, drugs. You can't drug yourself happy, and you can't drug yourself healthy. Drugs don't make champions. <laughs> drugs don't make champions. What makes champions? Now, this is what I call the, 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 the negative triad. The negative triad. And I keep away from all of these. I don't keep away from food wholly, but I want to make the distinction between that one and the other one. I want to make a distinction between the, food, the word food and nutrition. You would probably agree that there is a distinction to be made between food and nutrition. You'd probably agree that it's possible to eat small amounts of food and yet be well nourished. 
You'd probably agree with that, wouldn't you? It's possible to eat a small amount of food and yet still be well nourished. And it's, op it's possible to do the opposite, eat large amounts of food, but still be malnourished. And there are plenty of people in the UK who are eating large amounts of food in terms of the volume and the caloric intake, but they're malnourished because they're living on pizzas, donuts and beer. Sleep is a key component for emotional stability. If you, and again, there's a, there's a reactive link between the two. If you, don't, if you don't have emotional stability and emotional resilience, you can't sleep. And if you can't sleep, you don't get emotional stability. So there's an interactive relationship between sleep. So I take sleep very seriously and I also take exercise very seriously because I recognise the physiological benefits and the psychological benefits of regular exercise. So three times a week I'm in the garage lifting weights and I do that religiously, almost religiously. Even if I don't feel like it, now look at that, even if I don't feel like it, I'll do it anyway. Because I know that long range that has a tremendous benefit, not only physiologically but psychologically and in my sense of self because it's, it, it ties to my self image. Uh, have a look at page nine. To what degree do you think, oh, let's go back to, no. I'm on the wrong page. Uh, I'm on page 10. To what degree do you see people around you using alcohol, food and drugs to try to cope with stress? Uh, could you just jot down an answer? People around you, how many people do you know who tend to, when they're down in the dumps, they feel stressed out, the first thing they do is turn to alcohol or food or some form of medication? either legal or illegal. To what degree do the people around you use alcohol, food and drugs to try to cope with stress? Well, I've got a friend who's off the, off the alcohol now. I've got a friend of mine, she's always feeling stressed. When she's stressed, she hits the bottle. Uh, none, because I don't allow these people into my life. <laughs> Keep out. <laughs> That's right. Keep out. If you're going to come to me with those cakes and alcohol, well, fine, you can come around, but I'm not going to drink them. So I was out to the party last night. I drank orange squash. I used to have the uh, Nikki taken out of me for that. I was in the police for a while, and we'd go out on PUs, PUs, and I was the only one there drinking orange squash or fizzy water. And they used to take the Nikki out of me relentlessly, hoping to bend me into drinking alcohol, you see. And it's been on for about 10 years. And I said, you're wasting your time, guys. I ain't going to drink it. I've got my training tomorrow. And there's no way you're going to get me drinking that mess because I don't want to end up like you. I said that to my friends. Uh, anyway, how, next question. Uh, this is more personal to you. How would you rate your current sleep, nutrition and exercise habits? If you gave yourself a score out of 10, how would you rate your sleep patterns out of 10? Do you sleep well or not? How would you rate your nutrition? Not the amount you eat, but the quality. And how would you rate your exercise habits? Out of 10. Seven. S seven out of 10. Now, is that for all three together? I usually break this into actually three. So if you give yourself three numbers and add it up, that's the score out of 30. And the rule is you've got to get more than 20 when you add them all up. That's the rule. If you add up your score for sleep, 30. Whoa, top marks. Thank you very much. Appreciate that one. You see, and the next thing is, if you are sleeping well, eating well and exercising, question, how would that affect the way you feel? You see, well, it's obvious because what you have is a word there relating to the word energy, which is called vitality. Have you heard the word vitality? It's connected to all those four words, sleep, nutrition, exercise and energy equals vitality. A lack of vitality is associated to the opposite. So, Maggie, 25. 25, well done Maggie, 25. See, it should never drop below 20. And here's the point, even especially during difficult times, if you are under pressure emotionally, it's absolutely crucial that you stay away from these uh, and clear, your, clear the decks of this rubbish whilst you're under stress and get over to, that side. 
Now, most people do the opposite. When they are under stress, they turn, they turn to these. And then they say, I'm doing it because I'm stressed. And I'd say, no, that is simply another set of stressors. If you're already stressed by the outside world, and then you add alcohol, bad food, and drugs onto that pile, you're going to smash your bodily functions. And that will make you feel worse rather than better. You are undercutting. But because it's so perennially true that, that practically the vast majority of the population are doing this, it doesn't seem out of sorts. It seems normal. But just because it's normal doesn't mean it's any good. There are plenty of bad things that are very normal. So I'm just going to go, uh, so we're coming to an end. Uh, let's have a look at our summary points, page 11. I've taken the six points I've made and I've just reduced them down to some, some simple sentences. Page 11. Never guess. This is back to, uh, going back to the word knowledge. I'm on page 11. Going back to the word knowledge. Never guess. Get the facts. Now I'm picking up the word reason. Don't dramatise. Judge rationally and logically. Uh, now we're talking about uh, the thought process. Think about the can-do portion of the job. And um, now we're talking about the belief. Believe. You can't just believe. We're not talking about faith here. Belief in the absence of proof. We're talking about reason. You have to come up with good reasons to believe that the future has the potential to be better than the present. You have to come up with good reasons and some logic. Because we can't sustain it over a long time unless there is good reason. Um, reassess, and this is a biggie, number five, this might be a biggie, to reassess your self-image and make yourself the master of your own destiny. You see, you're not pushed around by what other people say or what happens. You're pushed around only by this thing inside here, and we control this. Well, at least we can, if we get the hang of it. And the physical body generate more energy by the proper use of nutrition, sleep, sleep and exercise. Now, I've got I, thought, I found something the other day, uh, a terrific quote, which I didn't put in the notes. I, I couldn't, I, I kind of knew it in the back of my mind, but then I forgot about it. And then about an hour ago, I remembered it again. So I put it in my notes. You, you may have heard it. This is it from Thomas Je Jefferson. Fix reason firmly in her seat and call to her tribunal every fact and every opinion. Question with boldness even the existence of God, because if there is one, he must, he must surely approve of the homage to reason rather than a blindfolded fear. Now, we haven't got blindfolded fear, but we've got pretty close. There's a lot of fear out there. And uh, I like that quote. Fix for her reason firmly in her seat and call to her tribunal every fact and every opinion. So, um, That is the diagram I want to start and finish on. If you can memorise that, that would be nice. <laughs> but there's so much to say that this diagram opens the doors on so many other things. But it's a nice starting point, something to get our heads around and at least something to organise our thinking and to refer to if we're trying to explain it to other people. I always believe that people need to see an idea as well as hear an idea. If you talk to people or write it down in just words, they don't see it. And they have, many people have to say, I don't see what you mean. You see, they literally don't see what you mean. So I'd like to give an idea a shape and a form and a definite structure, and then it's easier to understand, it's easier to explain, it's, it's easier to remember. And if we understand it, we can talk about it and we can remember it, we're much more likely to implement it. And it's only in the implementation of ideas that we make any real progress and get better results. Uh, four minutes. And I just want to get to my last slide. Which is just the thank you slide. Energy, the capacity to do work away from that there's our diagram thank you to discuss how you might implement this uh, yes. so yes thank you very much for coming today if you enjoyed that I, I hope you did and I hope you find it interesting if ever you want to talk to me about uh, similar things or if you would like us to come in-house and do some in-house training please call us on that number we would be honored to do work with you and your teams uh, it's what we do for a living 
But until the next time, if you're coming back, I would very much like to see you. Hope you enjoyed that. And unless you've got a question, I'll just pause for questions, and otherwise we'll put a line under it, and we'll finish. If you want to stick around and ask me questions, that's great. Otherwise, we'll stop and I'll wave goodbye. Thank you.